So for now, I invite your careful attention as Brother John comes to speak to us on why did God create human beings? Oh, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> We've got some clues uh, in the way in which the chapter that we read together is set out as to why God uh, created human beings, mankind. Um, and so if we just turn to Genesis chapter 1, I'm going to spend a few moments thinking about the way in which the creation record is described to us, and then think about what that tells us about what God was intending to do when he created man. Now, in the first couple of verses, we have a, a context for creation which is set out for us. Uh, it, it's a couple of summary verses, as it were. So it says, tells you at the very beginning of our Bibles what the earth is like and what God does. So it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth is without form and void, and darkness is upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moves upon the face of the waters. At this point, creation has not yet begun. This is a, a kind of, as we said, an introductory couple of verses. And then in verse 3, God says, let there be light, and there was light. That's the first creative act that we have described. And if we just go to chapter 2 and verse 1, we see that we get, in the first three verses of chapter 2, the, the conclusion the summary of the conclusion of this first uh, chapter. So chapter 1 and verse 1 said, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then chapter 2 and verse 1 says, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And the way in which God completed that is by resting on the seventh day, as it's described in verses 2 and 3. So chapter 1 verse 1 through to chapter 2 verse 3 is really the first creation account. And in chapter 1 and verse 2, we have, as we've said, a context for God's creation. And what it does here is describe what the earth is like before God creates light. And it uses, and it describes it in a couple of different phrases. It says, the earth is without form and void, and then it talks about darkness being on the face of the deep. So what does it mean for the earth to be without form and void? You keep a, a finger in Genesis chapter 1, and you come across to Isaiah 45. Have a good example of what this first word means, without form. <coughs> Isaiah 45 and verse 18. We read, Thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. So here, the idea of, um, of not in vain, and it, was, and it is formed to be inhabited, gives us a clue as to what the idea of the formation of the earth is about, because he didn't make it in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. So something that has form then is something that can be inhabited. And what this word really is talking about is a structure or a vessel. So something that is without form is uninhabitable. Um, and it has no, it cannot be inhabited. So if we imagine a glass, for instance, the, the, the form is like the structure of the glass. And if there was no form to it, if it was uh, a 2D structure um, or, or the form was not there, um, then nothing could be inhabited. Nothing could go into it. It was, um, it was uh, uninhabitable. So it says the earth is uninhabitable, without form, without structure, and it is void. Now, if we just go to Isaiah 34, we have a, another verse which picks up on this word and tells us what void is. Isaiah 34 
and verse 11. So it says, the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it. This is talking about a land. The owl also and the raven shall dwell in it, and he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. And that word is the stones of voidness. They shall call the nobles thereof to the kingdom, but none shall be there, and all her princes shall be nothing. So the idea here of void is something which is empty. Uh, it, it is uninhabited. So the way in which the Bible begins is to describe the earth as something which is without structure and there is nothing in the structure. It is without form and it is void. There's nothing there. And yet, at the end of verse 2, there is this source of power. There is this spirit of God which is moving or hovering upon the face of the waters. So we have a contrast between something which has no structure or form, void, it's uninhabitable, it's uninhabited, and yet there is this great source of energy which is fluttering or hovering, vibrating above the earth, ready to create. And how then God creates is described in the next few verses. And the reason that we've just spoken for a few minutes about the idea of form and void is because the way in which God's creation is then structures, is, is structured, directly answers or speaks to the idea of something being without a form and, without, uh, uh, and void. Because there are two lots of three days, and the first three days God creates the structures, he creates the form. And on the next few days, day four, five, and six, God fills those forms. He creates the structure, and then he fills the structure. So we see here that the first structure, or in a sense what is a structure, is the idea of light and darkness. God creates light on the first day. Uh, verse five, uh, verse four, God saw the light that it was good and God divided the light from the darkness and God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. So here is a division, a creation of light which divides it from darkness. So we've got these two different uh, entities as it were, we've got darkness, we've got light. And in that sense, there is in the creation of light, a, a, a very, kind of basic or very fundamental structure which has been created or, or, or kind of phenomenal. The second day, then God says, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven and the evening and the morning were the second day. So here, the second day, the first day we've got a division between light and darkness, the second day, but the strange idea of a firmament, a body of water, which is then collected and divided from the water on the earth, which then becomes a, a, a structure uh, which is described as the heavens. So if we think about structure, we've effectively got uh, kind of layers uh, vertical layers or a vertical building up from the earth, the water on the earth built up into the, the heavens above it. So we're kind of, we're building up a very precise structure. Light and dark, the most fundamental. And then we've got earth with water on it and above it, the heavens. And then the third day, God says in verse nine, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear and it was so. So in the same way that we got that vertical structure, now we've got almost like a horizontal structure, if you imagine the surface of the earth, with the waters parting, which have been left on the earth, and land appears. So we've got land and water. And here then we have the earth as we know and see it today. So then, having created this structure, we arrive at the other uh, for uh, three days in verse 14. 
And God said in verse 14, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So here are sources of light which are populating the or, or re replacing related to the first day, the division of light and darkness, night and day. And, and here are these sources, these this created sources of light that God has made, which are then related to this first day. The, the, the concept, the structure of light and dark was created, and now God kind of makes this sun and moon and stars which, which relate to this first day and which populate the light and the darkness, as it were, become the source of light and, and populate the darkness. The form was created on the first day. On the fourth day, that form was, was populated. Uh, and God, uh, we read on in verse uh, 15, let them be for light in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also, and he set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. So we have a population then of that structure that God has created. Then in verse 20, we read, and God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that have life and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and the winged fowl after his kind. And in verse 22, God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply and the evening, the morning in verse 23 with the fifth day. So here, remember on the second day, God created the heaven and the waters below, and now God populates that. That structure has been made, and now it's been populated. It is no longer void. It has a form, and now it's been filled with birds in the heaven and with sea creatures uh, within the waters below. And then on the final day of creation, the sixth day, that which was left over, that on the third day, the creation of the earth, is now populated, um, populated by animals and by uh, man. God said that the earth bring forth the living creature in verse 24, and God, verse 25, made the beast of the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And then finally, God in verse 26 says, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So we see then what began as formless and voidless, has, God has followed a very precise sequence, a very precise process to address those problems, as it were, or address those nothingnesses with what he has created. And it speaks then to the way in which God provides. And it also speaks to a very precise purpose. Here is not kind of an arbitrary um, creation. It was not six days, I'll do a bit of this and do a bit of that. This was a very precise an ordered and sequenced way in which God has gone about creating the heavens and the earth and everything that is in the earth, because God has a purpose. And as he began with light and darkness, that creation has built up to man. And there's something quite unique and different about man. He is in the image of God and creation builds up to the creation of man. And in fact, when we think about the rest of creation, everything else is sustaining this pinnacle of God's creation, which is mankind. You needed that structure. You needed the light and darkness. You needed those firmaments. You need a heaven and you need an earth in order to populate it with birds and animals. And you need the waters and land. And so it brings forth life so that it all sustains man. And man is there at the pinnacle who is multiplying and replenishing and having dominion. He is in control of God's creation. 
So there's something unique about how man, what man is, made in the image and likeness of God, and he occupies a unique and privileged position over creation. So we finish then, if we were to read the rest of the verses, through to chapter 2 and verse 3. And that is God completing creation. But then in verse 4 of chapter 2, we have the same description of creation repeated for us, but this time it's got a slightly different focus. The focus here really zones in upon man. Now we know it's a new section um, because uh, well, it starts with, with a little kind of interesting structure in the Hebrew in verse 4. And we're also introduced to a new name for God, Yahweh, in verse 4, which we will not really think about that this uh, afternoon, but it's that that particular purpose is all about man, God's purpose with man um, and what he is going to do uh, with man. Uh, and this is introduced here um, in verse 4. So there's a little kind of uh, bookmark for us or, or, or flag for us to say, well, this is now, this is a new description about creation, but there's something, but there's a point that God is making. What is that point? Well, let's just read uh, from verse 5. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for Yahweh God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. So a little bit like verse 1 of chapter 1, where there was a, where there was a problem. There was no structure, there was no, there was, there was no form, uh, and, vo and it was void. Here, well, before God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there wasn't a man to till the ground. And there is a relationship between these things that God is describing, because there needs to be rain to fall onto the ground to create herbs and, and vegetation, for man to then work and serve and be uh, amongst the ground um, and to be a part of and interact with God's creation. And so what we have in the next couple of verses is God addressing that problem. Same problem really, but just couched in, um, it framed in a slightly different way, in different context. So there went up a mist from the earth, so there's your rain, uh, um, and watered the whole face of the ground, and, God, and the Lord, Yahweh God, formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul or a living being, a living thing. So here then, we've already had the creation of man described, but this describes the more detailed process of how man was created. And what we notice about verse 7, is that the way in which man is created follows the exact same pattern as Genesis chapter 1. Because God forms man of the dust of the ground, and then he breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. God creates a form, he creates a structure, but that structure isn't living. And then God puts into that structure the breath of life. He breathes into man, and man becomes animated and a living being, a thinking creation. So man is created then, and we just want to kind of just park, as it were, uh, for a moment, this idea of the way in which God creates. He creates a form and then he fills it. But man is created then, and having created man, God plants a garden, east in Eden, so he, he segregates a portion of his creation and he puts man into, uh, into that garden, who he had formed, and there are all these different plants there, and the man then is, in verse 15, he is to be in the garden to dress it and to keep it. So, what we have is a man who is in part of God's creation, who 
is there to look after it and to guard it, as the word keep, and to look, and to look after it and, and to sustain it. And man has been filled with the spirit of God, the life of God, the breath of God. And man has been made in the image of God, and man is to have control or dominion over the other animals and, uh, and the, the entirety of God's creation. And man has also been told in chapter 1 that he is going to multiply and he's going to fill the earth, replenish the earth and subdue it. And what we have here then is an indication of the purpose of God in man. He wants man who is a picture of himself, he's in God's image, who's filled with God's life, God's breath, as the rest of creation is, but it's particularly brought out for man. He wants man to look after, to guard, to fill, to replenish, to multiply, and to have dominion and control over God's creation. So here, in a sense, we have many replenishing and multiplying figures in the image of God, filling God's creation. And what this speaks to, and as we'll see, is the idea that God is manifested. He is, um, he is imaged. He is um, his character and, uh, and his being are reflected and fill his creation. And there is a oneness between his creation working in harmony with him. And in this way, the creation reflects the glory and the power and the beauty of the creator. And this is a glory which is then a, um, a glory to God. And this is part then of not the essence of the purpose of God with man, to have his creation at one with him through particularly man on the earth in his image. Now what's interesting is this idea of image and the idea of God breathing into man is a physical reflection of the creator and the creation. But as we'll see, it also speaks to the idea that man not just is a, ref a physical reflection of God, but is a a, a, a mental and an emotional reflection of God, that actually man is, is a true manifestation of God. And the idea of God breathing his breath into man, it speaks a little bit more to the idea of just the way in which man is animated, because the breath is really the words of, of God. And the words are a reflection of the mind of God. And so, although this is the way that God breathes and animates and brings man to life, in a metaphorical sense, this is what, what God is really intending, is that his mind, that God's characteristics, are breathed into and become the source of man's life. And that's really what is happening here with the creation record in the way that it's described. Man has, well, man multiplies, has dominion. Uh, and we could go to chapter 2 and talk about the way in which he does this with the woman. And actually, let's just keep a finger in Genesis chapter 2, but go to the verse that we read in Isaiah 45, where we picked up on the idea of formed. This is purposeful to God. This is important to God. He has made something to be inhabited. And particularly, he wants the earth to be inhabited by a living, breathing human that can understand who he is, what he is, and loves him and responds to him in a positive way. But what actually happened? Well, in Genesis chapter 3, if we turn back to Genesis chapter 3, God 
gave man an instruction in Genesis chapter 2 that in this garden he was to eat and drink whatever he wanted apart from a particular tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that he was not to eat. So here is a little test for man, a constraint on his experience within the garden. And man fails this test. He isn't in the image of God. He hasn't got the same mind as God. He's not being obedient to his father, to his creator. He is disobedient. He decides to eat of the tree and he falls from this position of privilege. And he is at the end of chapter three, thrust out of the garden. And for in this first instant, God's purpose and the way in which God was intending to go about doing these create man is frustrated by man's disobedience to God and we read on a little bit and we get to chapter 5 and we read in verse 5 that that first creation Adam had uh, a child we read in verse 5 and verse uh, 1 uh, of chapter 5 in the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. You've read that in chapter 1. Male and female created he then and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. So although this is just a physical reality that Seth looks like Adam, also takes us back to Genesis chapter 1, doesn't it? And it talk, takes us back to the purpose of God in wanting to have a creation in his image and his likeness that thought and acted like him. And Seth thought and acted like Adam. And in fact, by the time we get to chapter 6, we read in verse 1 of chapter 6, that man had done exactly as God had told him to do. He had multiplied on the face of the earth. Verse 1 of chapter 6, it came to pass when man began to multiply on the face of the earth, daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them, wives of all which they chose. And the Lord Yahweh said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. And there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, they bare children to them, and the same became mighty men, which were of old men of a man. So you've got this multiplication of humans on the earth. God told them to multiply. But we read in verse 5 that God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, if you just keep uh, a finger uh, there, and if you come to Psalm 103, Psalm 103, verse 14, We read, verse 13, Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. Now this is not the same word as the word for form, um, which we get back in Genesis. But the idea of frame here is a collection of three Hebrew words. Um, and it's the third of three Hebrew words, which are all related, which are to do with pouring out or the thing that you pour something into. And the frame is that which you pour something into. And they're all used to describe often the creation of idols. So you create an idol, and you create like a mold, and you pour into it molten metal, and, that's the, and it creates this, this idol then. Um, and that is actually exactly the same way that we've just spent a while thinking about Genesis chapter one and the way in which God created a frame 
and then poured into it his spirit, breathed into it his spirit. But we see, and the reason we went to Psalm 103 is that although that's not the same word as Genesis chapter 1, clearly that is a word which describes the creation of man because it was the frame of God. He remembers our frame that we are dust. So that's the frame. And why we've gone to there is because that is the same Hebrew that we see now in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. You might look in your uh, margin and actually won't help you because mine just says whole imagination, but that is the word for frame. So the point is... That in the beginning, God said, here's man, he's in my image, and here's his frame, and I'm going to pour into him my spirit, which is really like my words going into him, and I want them to think and be like me. And now, by Genesis chapter 6, Adam has had a son, and that son is in his image. And man has multiplied, but the frame, what is inside of man, is not the thoughts of God, but is only evil continually the imagination of the thoughts of his heart the frame of the thoughts of his heart inside that body is only evil continually so again it reinforces to us that the purpose of god the way in which god created the way in which he wanted to interact with man was not going well at this particular point and God therefore destroys his creation in the, preceding, um, in the preceding chapters. And he wipes out man and he starts again with Noah. But if we were then to read on, Noah and his family and, and the rest of those families, things go wrong again. And so we get to Exodus chapter 19. And the second great creation within God's, uh, within, within our Bibles. And here God has taken a family, we haven't really thought about this, he's taken the family of Abraham, he took him out of his own family, he's, he's built him up into, and the family has multiplied into a nation. So God is again thinking about, well, this is Genesis chapter 1, the family of Abraham is going to multiply. It's going to become a nation. It's, that's the structure. And we read then about this structure here in Exodus chapter 19, where we read, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings, in verse 4, and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. You shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So this is talking here about God. Well, God is giving words to Moses to give to the children of Israel to, to, to convey to them how important they are to him. They are going to be a, in the same way that man had dominion over the other animals and creation. Here, there is something which is particularly precious and important about this people. They are, as it were, going, well, they are going to be an example of how God works with and how he manifests himself in a nation. So it's following the creation pattern. And he says, you are a peculiar treasure to me above all people for all the earth is mine. And so Israel is really playing the part of man here. They are going to be made in God's image. And if we move on a few chapters into and books into Numbers chapter 2, in the same way that we had the structure of man, the body of man, filled with the breath of man, now we get the structure of the nation. And the nation is divided in a very precise way, just as the days of creation were in a precise way. The tribes of Israel set out. And we have a description of the order of all of these tribes and all of their structure, the frame or, 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 um, of, uh, of the nation. 
And we read here in chapter 2, every man, and verse 2, every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard with the ensign of their father's house, far off about the tabernacle of the congregation shall they pitch. So just as we saw the, the, the body of man is filled, now we get the body of a nation, and right at the heart of that nation, filling that nation, is the law of God, and right at the heart, there is the tabernacle, which is the center of their worship. God has filled that nation with his word and his law, and that is then manifested in the tabernacle structure, and right in the heart of the tabernacle is the ark, and right above the ark is the mercy seat, and right above the mercy seat is the very being of God, the glory of God on earth, right at the heart of the nation. He has physically and literally filled it, and in the fact that his law is sitting underneath the ark, there is that metaphorical filling of the nation with his law. But it follows exactly the same pattern as Genesis. And we'll just go to one example, which is if you go to 1st of Samuel chapter 4, just to reinforce this point, when you go to 1st of Samuel chapter 4 and verse 21, this nation develops, it matures, it gets a king. The king makes some problems, I did this before, it's got a king. Um, and the glory of the ark, which is right at the heart of Israel Jewish worship, is taken from Israel. And the way in which that is described is the glory is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken. And that was the, the essence of, of God dwelling with man, the ark, his law his presence, the Shekinah glory, and it was taken away by the Philistines. And that is the glory of God. God's glory wanted to dwell and emanate forth from the center of that nation through the nation so that the nation reflected and manifested him. And here is in this second creation an example of where that failed. But if we just go back to Numbers chapter 14, that was one example where the glory departs. There are times in the history of this nation where even though things are not going well, God repeats what his purpose was. So here in Numbers chapter 14, everything is going wrong. The people of God, Israel, are rejecting him. They want to go back to Egypt. They don't want to go into the land that he has selected. But he says to them, he punishes them, he forgives them, but he says that they cannot go. There's this selection of people that wants to go back to Egypt, or well, they're not going to go into the land. But he says in verse 21, as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. And the point being that even though my purpose keeps getting frustrated, it is inevitable that God is going to fill the earth with his glory. He is going to populate the earth with man. He is going to be manifested. Maybe these people will not enter into the land. Maybe this nation is falling away, but there is going to be a way in which God is going to realize what he wanted in Genesis chapter one. And so finally, let's just turn to the third and the final creation of God. Let's go to second of, well, let's go to Hebrews chapter one first. Because in Hebrews chapter one, we have a description of the Lord Jesus Christ. And each person that came along and believed in God and tried to follow his words reflected his image to an extent, but they failed. Until, of course, Christ came along, who is described here in verse 3 of chapter 1 as the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his purpose. So here is a man who is the perfect manifestation of God. And if we were to go to the beginning of, let's, let's go to the beginning of 
John's Gospel. Here he is, he's in the image of God, and what is in him? John chapter 1 and verse 14. Describing Christ as the Word of God, saying that Christ was such a powerful and perfect reflection of his Father that he was, as it were, the Word. He was the manifestation, the, the, co- the, 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 the breath of God consolidated into human form. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, and in him he was full. His frame was there, he was in the image of God, he was the express person, and within him was grace and truth. On the inside and on the outside, and the things that he did and how he spoke, Christ was God manifest in the flesh. But what about everybody else. What about men and women? Because Christ was a single man. And everybody else has still made attempts, those that have, to follow after this pattern, but they have failed. Well, if we go to Matthew chapter 26, because what God has done then, the way that God has overcome the repeated frustration of his purpose, which is sin, which is man's inability to obey God, the way that he has done this is to say, well, if you associate yourselves with Christ, if you show faith, if you demonstrate that you believe that you are sinful and unworthy, but that you can be saved, on that basis I will forgive your sins, and you can become, just like Christ, an adopted son of mine, a perfect reflection of me. You can be one with me, and the sin that is within you, and the things and the thoughts that you have, and the things that you do which separate you from me and break that oneness, that will be removed through, because I will forgive you, and I will clothe you with the righteousness of God, of, uh, of my son, uh, who was that perfect example. Now, what's interesting about Matthew chapter 26 is it describes the institution of the memorial feast, the partaking of bread and wine. And when we looked in Genesis chapter 1, what we saw was the, the thing which populated man was the Spirit of God. And that's described in various places as as something which can go over or which can go in something. So sometimes it is hovering above the earth and sometimes it is put into the heart of a person. And that idea of the Spirit being poured into something is picked up in Acts, which gives us the New Testament as a quotation from our Old Testaments, which gives us a... It gives the same words for what the spirit can do, that the spirit is poured into something. And that word then, the pouring out of the spirit, is the same word which is used predominantly for the shedding of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we read in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 27 that Jesus took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink you all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed, which is poured out for many for the remission of sins. And just before that, he has spoken about the body. This is the, my bread, take eat, this is my body. And what there seems to be here then in the bread and in the wine, or in representing the body and the blood, is effectively the equivalent between those two things that we saw in Genesis, the frame, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is then filled or covered with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the life-giving source. The life is in the blood, our Bibles tell us. But what this is describing then is the new creation. Those people that partake of bread and wine 
to remember the Lord Jesus Christ are memorialising the fact that Christ died and that he rose and that those people which have been baptised have been baptised into Christ and they reside then as part of his figurative body. They are part of the body of Christ. But remember in Genesis chapter 1, that body was dead. Because it cannot just be a body of Christ, it has to be a body which is filled, which is covered with the blood of Christ, and which is filled with the Spirit of God, the Word of God, that which was within Christ, which emanated forth from him. And that is the same of the new creation both talking about an ecclesia, or a, a, a meeting of people. They are a body of people, but they need to have the living word of God within them. It is not just a structure. It has to be a filled and alive being. Or as an individual, we as individuals, as members of the body of Christ, cannot just be members. We have to have the word which invigorates us and brings us and makes us alive. And so this is exactly in our last verse what we are told in what Paul by the Spirit is caused to write in Ephesians chapter 2 describing the, the church, describing the believers in Christ. They are Verse 20, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye are builded together for a habitation, for a dwelling place of God through the Spirit. So here God dwells within the ecclesia. He is alive. He is manifested within uh, a body of people. And this is his purpose. This was his purpose in Genesis chapter 1. It was his purpose in, through the nation of Israel. And it is his creation, in, it's his purpose in the new creation in Christ. That a group of people should be alive. Should be filled with his words and his thoughts. And that should manifest him. And God says that that is what is happening at the moment. This is what is being built in the, the bringing together of more men and women into the body of Christ. And ultimately, what that will point forwards to is when the earth is filled full of men and women that love God and that manifest him to his glory. Thank you.